Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Shahid. I'm a product manager on the Chrome OS team. And uh, welcome to all of you uh, to our session on developing Android apps on Chrome OS. Now, we talked about this uh, last year at I.O. And if you saw that talk, uh, today's talk is a continuation. We'll be talking about the basics briefly um, and talking about uh, how we've worked with a number of you over the, the past year, and as well as sharing a number of new features that we'd love to tell you about. So first of all, um, let's talk about why this matters. So we've talked previously about the success of Chromebooks within the education space, where we outsell every other device combined. But Google's really been doubling down on Chrome OS. Uh, you've hopefully been inundated by ads over Q4 last year and ongoing this year. And that's helped drive demand in the consumer space, too. So much so that in Q4 last year, 17% of notebooks sold in the US were Chromebooks. So why does this matter to you, Android developers? So the headline here is, Android apps work on Chrome OS. How does that happen? It works via the Android framework running inside a container that sits on top of the base of Chrome OS. And the full Play Store is already available. So your app is probably already running on Chrome OS. Now, ultimately, what we care about is a good user experience. Part of that is the operating system itself. And part of that is the apps that users choose to run. And we've been investing heavily in improving the product. And those of you who use Chrome OS over the past year have seen evidence of that in system updates that you've gotten. And many of you who are developing apps, we've already been working with to ensure that you're uh, ensuring that the apps work really well on Chrome OS. Adobe, Roblox, Sony, EA, and many, many more have already included Chromebook optimizations in their latest updates onto the Play Store. And that's opening up different kinds of usage and different kinds of revenue. May Allen, PM from Evernote, told us Pixelbook users are spending four times more time in Evernote than an average app user. And Andrew and David, founders from Steadfast Innovation, who make the Squid app, told us that Chromebooks have made up 21% of their revenue over the last 30 days. So first of all, to begin, uh, we're quickly going to review some basics. Ensuring that an app works well on Chrome OS comes down to four key differences between Chromebooks and phones. Wider screens, default landscape, window management, and different primary input devices, keyboard, pointer, stylus. First, wider screens. Chromebook screens are bigger, from 10.1 inch on the smaller side to 15 inch on some of our larger units. So apps need to be able to work well at all of these widths and respond appropriately to resize events. For example, AIDE's coding lessons now switch to a two-column view when the app is resized to be wider. Second, default landscape. As a default landscape device, apps need to have a really great landscape experience. And so for example, Pocket Casts pins open its navigations menu and arranges items in a grid so they can fill the space available rather than listing items out with white space to the right. Third, multi-window. Chrome OS is a multi-window desktop environment. The SignEasy and Sony Sketch apps in their latest versions on the Play Store are now resizable. So users can work better with these inside our environment. And finally, maybe the most important, keyboard and mouse inputs. When a user pulls out a laptop and uses it, uh, the keyboard and touchpad are closest to the user, so they gravitate towards them as their primary inputs. So the Infinite Painter team, as an example, built keyboard accelerators for common commands so users can get around faster inside the interface. And that's especially true for games. So Pixonic, who make all robots, built keyboard controls into their game. The game now uses a special manifest flag to get inputs directly from Chrome OS and enables standard WASD gaming controls. So these are just a few of the app teams who are now building and testing their apps for Chrome OS. And a huge, huge thank you to everyone, many of you are here in the audience, that we've worked with. We're always looking for apps that work really, really great on Chrome OS so that we can show them off. And we want your app to be one of them. 
Now, to talk about some of the latest improvements in Chrome OS for Android app developers, I'd like to hand over to Stefan, one of our lead engineers on Chrome OS. Please welcome Stefan. Morning, everyone. I'm glad that you could all join for today's talk. And I'm here to talk about, well, all our latest news, what we have done, and what you can do in order to improve your application even more for a desktop environment. So first slide, uh, what is new? So that is one of the things which is mostly important for the user, but of course also has some impact on what you're doing. And then advanced things you can do. We have added a lot of stuff over the last year, and we really want to show that. And we hope that you are actually making best use of it. And last of it, best practices. So when you are following these best practices, you will have a better chance in the Play Store because you will bubble up, and we will make sure of that. So what's new? Let's see. So first off, we have improved our tablet mode. Why did we do that? Because we have now also a tablet-only device. Well, and what did we change? Well, there are smoother animations. We have removed the caption bar, so it means the window control bar. And the controls from the caption control bar, they are actually now moving down into the shelf, as you can see there. And uh, also, all windows are automatically started full screen, so which is, of course, the experience what you expect on a tablet. So next thing is split screen. We have added split screen, which is, uh, well, you know that, of course, from phones. But now on a big tablet and or a bigger screen, it makes, of course, much more sense. So you can split now the screen with any kind of window which is available on Chrome OS. So it might be, well, it might be a Chrome window, might be, of course, an Android window. The only thing is, at the moment, you will not be able to figure out that you are actually running in split screen. We will add that later. The next thing is we have added picture and picture. So it's the full specification according to Android O, and it'll come in soon. And um, you can resize the window. You can actually place it at multiple locations, and it will be fairly similar to the one which we are using for web applications as well. So we have also added. Uh, the Android keyboard, so you can essentially replace now, uh, coming soon, um, the, the, the Chrome OS keyboard with an Android keyboard, which makes a lot of people happy. Notifications, we have overhauled our notifications. They are looking not now much more alike, so color scheming and everything should be much more integrated. You have to tap now instead of swiping, and well, everything is much more integrated into the Chrome OS style in itself. And uh, yeah, Pro Audio. So we have actually added since M65, beginning of this year, M, that's our milestones. I don't know if you know that. But uh, it's essentially like every six weeks, we have a new release cycle. And M65 is out already since a while. And uh, MIDI is in since a while in, in our Pixel book. So and soon, we will also have multi-channel audio, USB audio, uh, multi-channel USB, A audio, A audio memory mapped. And this is all coming later this year. And with that, you have actually seen when you were coming in someone playing music here. He was actually using a pixel book. And to show you a little bit more about that, I want to invite Frederico Tesman from the founder of Algorithm to actually show how this works.
Thank you. So you have possibly seen how everything was really real time, synchronized with a device, and everything is real time. So it's getting more interesting. Advanced thinks now what you can do to your application in order to make your life, well, to make the life on a desktop better. Well, become desktop native. I think I had that already last year, but we have, of course, a follow up on that one. So, first off, this is something which is something everybody knows from an everyday business, right? Menu accelerators. They are not really very something special, right? But the thing is, like, if you were using the toolkit UI in the past, it was actually from A. I think it was like, uh, I don't know, Angel Cake or whatever Android was back then. Uh, so, means like really ancient. So, display was small, and they had to actually fit everything on there, and it looked ugly. It was really not, not meant to be prime time. So, we have actually changed the library to make this much, much easier for you to actually get these kind of things in. So, and all you have to do is you have to go into your layout XML, you use in your menu, you put into the item itself, then the, the shortcut means the character and the modifier keys, and you're ready to go. Well, not entirely, but if you're using a standard menu, you have to actually call then the set QWERTY. Uh, 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 what was it again? Set QWERTY mode to true, uh, so that you're actually getting alphanumeric characters. OK, this is really old, but it's still there. So shelf integration. That is something like, if you want to do something inside the shelf, you want to change your icon, like, for example, you're opening a document or whatnot, you want to change the shape of the icon itself, or you want to display then the document which you have opened, you can actually do that with this set task description. Very simple and very effective. Next thing is, if you want to combine multiple items inside the shelf into one menu item, you can actually put then my intent put extra, you put then the shelf shortcut to it, and uh, you take then the, any kind of string for a kind of modifier which you actually know, and you actually then reuse it for all the items you want to put into the same thing. App shortcuts are coming. So this is something which is uh, coming soon. It's there already since, I think, NMR1, and we will support them very soon as well. So essentially, you can actually have actions and any kind of short things which you want to do in order to, uh, to get the user faster access to things. The back button. Well, I think many of you, since you were already doing something for Chrome OS, have already seen that there is a back button up in the window control bar. Well, you have also a back button. We know that. And the problem is, of course, two on top of each other looks pretty crappy. So therefore, by adding this special meta flag, you can get rid of it. Makes it much, much nicer, and that helps. But there's one other thing, and this is, I think, even more important. If you're on a desktop and you're pressing backspace or escape or navigate back or whatnot, and your window suddenly disappears, is something which is very unexpected to the user. Please don't do that. So if you can do it, please, what you should do is you should actually check if your activity is at the bottom of, well, at the root of the stack. And if it is, and you know that you're windowed, please don't close your window. Please keep it open, because it's really, really unexpected and disturbing for the user if suddenly all his work is suddenly gone. Lifetime management. So we were getting a lot of requests from, uh, from users which said, well, you know what? My application isn't really running multitasking. Well, why is it not multitasking? Well, because the thing is like, I have this game I'm playing, and I'm also checking my new status. And the new status isn't updating while I'm playing, but I would really like to see that. Well, there are actually three states. There is running, there is paused, and there is stopped. Running and paused means you are visible on the screen. So, which means not that you should actually drop everything and stop dead when you're getting a pause. No, you can actually continue to run, unless you are a high whatever game where you have to have a lot of real-time action and whatnot, where you maybe want to really pause. In most cases, you really want to continue running. So please do this, and you make a lot of users much, much happier. Next thing, sharing data. Well, I said already earlier that we have plenty of windows on our desktop, right? So there are all kinds of Chrome OS, your window, and whatnot. If you don't specify drag flag global and you are doing a drag and drop operation, it will not be dropped on another application. This is then only for you. So in order to allow other applications to actually get your data, please specify this flag. And if you are actually getting some data from someone, 
Well, also check out what you are getting. If you are simply blindly taking text, well, you might actually miss out of all the richness of the data which comes with it. So therefore, please check that out as well. And if you're looking at the clipboard, it's exactly the same thing. You definitely want to have, of course, all the richness of whatever is being copied and pasted as well. So with that, resizing. I was talking last year about resizing, that it's a really big problem, right? Because resizing looks pretty plonky on Android in general when you're doing this. So here is a solution for you. This is an application which was written for Material Design 2.0. And uh, it looks nice on a phone. See, this looks actually pretty nice. So when you are doing, when you're following the design study from, from Material Design, they were coming up with this thing for tablet form factor. See, there's more information. You can actually see more things. And they are revealing more stuff. So with that, let me show you a short demo of my notebook. So. So there's the application, and we can resize it. And as you can see, while I'm resizing it, more and more data is actually coming into play. And see, more stuff is coming. Oops, that was, of course, the wrong guy. Eh, there we go. And you see that more and more data is coming in. This is all dynamically happening, and it's very fluid without a restart, which is usually the problem, right? Can I back to my slides, please? So first off, good news. The demo is actually online. You can download it. You can test it out yourself. Um, it's on GitHub. And there's also an excellent code lab, which is actually even showing more. So you can also doing animations while you're transforming from one layout into another, which is then looking really cool. You should check out the, the code lab for sure. So how is it being done? Well, first off, you need to have a constrained layout state file. It's like a blueprint, which is essentially getting all the different layouts into, into some kind of order, when to use which one. And then comes the tricky part. Every of these layouts need to have all UI elements which you use. So if you don't want to see, if you want to show it, then you simply hide the thing. If it's hidden, it doesn't show, but it's still in the layout itself. So and by doing this, and in onCreate, you will actually create then the transition which you want to use when you want to transition from one to another. And you set the onConstraint changed layout handler. You will be able to, do, uh, uh, to add then the, the pre layout change handler, which is then essentially like giving the control to the, to the, to the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, which is giving the control to our layouter and um, which is doing the, the transition itself. So inside your activity, what you have to do is you have to add the on configuration change handler, which is usually being called every time when something changes, like the virtual keyboard is disconnected, the screen resolution changes, or anything like that. And find, well, and from there, you are essentially calling the constraint changed layout handler to actually let him know what the size is. And that will actually then do all the work for you. And finally, you will actually add inside the Android manifest file the request that you want to handle all configuration changes for size changes. And with that, you are done. If you want to try it out, again, try the code lab to actually get this done. So the next thing is near, well, zero latency ink. What does zero latency ink mean? Well, you have possibly had already a pen. You were trying to draw something. And you see there is a lag between drawing something or using the pen and seeing something on the, on the device itself. So where is it coming from? Well, first off, you have to read the sensor. You have to do the input processing. You have to then do the upcode whatever the application is doing. You have to do some drawing with OpenGL. Then you're actually doing multiple buffering, because you have to actually pass everything to the compositor, which is then compositing actually everything on the Chrome OS side, or whatever your operating system you have, the compositing side. And it's going through the entire pipeline, which might be four, four images or whatnot. So in total, you're coming out to 100 milliseconds of delay, which is very, very noticeable. So the ideal thing is, of course, you simply remove all the compositing. So now you are down to, well, roughly two frames, which is less than 32 milliseconds, right? 
So, but if we are adding now also the prediction logic to it, well, then we are really at pretty much zero. So, mission accomplished. So, and with that, I will actually hand it over to Paolo Riviera, a comic book author, which is showing us the whole thing in action. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hmm, let's see. All right, can you guys see what I got up there? So uh, I drew some Spider-Man. Uh, that's typically what I'm known for at Marvel, but I also drew Thanos. Did anyone see Infinity War yet? <laughs> All right, I did too. All right, so what I like about this app is, uh, you know, you can rotate, you can draw at any angle. You can also do layers. This is uh, Infinite Painter, by the way. So what I've done is I've, I've drawn Spidey ahead of time, and I'm going to ink on top of him using some of the inking tools. Oh, I've got to change my color. I'm from the school of thought where Spider-Man should have expressive eyes. And so I'm glad that they did that in the movies. Some people don't like doing the webbing, but I do. It does add a little bit of time to each panel, but it's worth it in the end. And then, of course, you can add color as well. I put in a, a, a layer already with a, uh, a red base, and I'm going to add some shadow to it. One of the other features I like about this is you can double tap to reset it, and then if you hold and long press, it'll flip it. So as a comic book artist, I'm always flipping things uh, if I can because it gives you a fresh perspective. And of course, there's all kinds of drawing uh, tools that you can use. Some are more painterly than others. And what I did was I clipped the shadow layer to the layer beneath it, which means that everything I do on this layer will be bounded by the layer below it. One way to save time. And of course, the other nice thing about the stylus is it has tilt. Uh, so in this case, I made tilt. Oh. Uh, depending on which way I hold the pen, it will give me a thick or thin line.
I could do this all day. <laughs> <laughs> I usually do. <laughs> usually this, there aren't this many people watching while I'm drawing. Y'all are lucky I'm even wearing pants. <laughs> and let's finish it off with some spidey sense, because uh, Thanos is nearby. And he's a Malthusian. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Thanks. OK, so how is it done? So we have an ink overlay view, which is a new thing, which is not yet really public. If you want to get access to it, there's a QR code. Please grab it and uh, sign up for our, our release. So you will actually be added then to our release notes as soon as we are giving you access to it. So, but essentially we have, well, you can see the code, and uh, it might change a little bit. So, multi-display, which is another topic. So it's a very big topic, because the thing is like on a phone, you have two screens, right? You have the internal screen, you have an external screen, maybe. On a, well, if you're really creative and you have a Pixelbook Pro, you might actually get up to seven screens. I'm not entirely sure. I've heard that is possible. So anyways, but the thing is like, what does it mean for you? Well, actually, it means a lot. Because the thing is like, many applications are doing stupid things. Uh, sorry, you are not that, right? Uh, but the thing is like, for example, simply using, hey, I want to get the display, uh, uh, the display information for display ID 0, well, which is a default display, right? Well, the thing is like, it's not the default display, because what is the default display? You don't know that, right? So therefore, we have actually, if you are pre-O, then we are thinking that you are a non-multi-aware, multi-display-aware application. And in this case, we have a special thing for you to make your life easier. Essentially, zero is like a virtual display, which is always a display you are on. So, and therefore, the entire API is, is really clear. Everything is exactly as it should be. But the thing is like, you get this kind of special display so that you are working fine. If, however, on the other hand, you are actually something after O or O, then you will actually get a different treatment. In that case, you will get the real IDs, the real display IDs. So therefore, if you are doing these kind of things, you should be careful what you are doing. So, and uh, yeah, as one additional thing is if you are actually running an NYC application, you still have the set launch display ID as a function call. So what should you do? Well, you should definitely use the, 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 the size of the window. So always use your context and try to get the, the display metrics from that. That is working perfectly for you. So and if you want to see any kind of changes, like for example, you were moved to a different display or something like, then look at uh, on configuration change to see these kind of changes. And uh, if you want to actually position yourself, think also about setting the set launch display ID if you do not want to get to the same screen where your current application is on. What you shouldn't do is you shouldn't really assume anything, well, without using your context. If you're using any kind of display ID, I mean, trying to get the default display, you will get something which is most certainly wrong. So and also, um, uh, what was that? Yeah, don't, don't make any assumptions that you are actually on the built-in display, because that is definitely wrong as well. And um, last but not least, uh, don't assume that you're always running from the same display. So presentation API, we were being asked to actually get this to you. We are getting that very, very soon. And uh, it is, well, actually, I think by pretty much by now it should be there. You can alternatively also use set launch display ID and set launch uh, bounce, which will actually do pretty much the same thing. Uh, 3D and gaming. So what is there? So basically, we have Vulkan support for, uh, for example, the Pixelbook. Um, 
It was actually shipping already. 1.0 was already shipping beginning of this year. 1.1 should be shipping around now. And older architectures are also on the way. So Vulkan is much faster than and so on. So when you are building your own game, one, so there are a few things what you should actually take care of. First off, you should always use the latest version of the framework. If you're using Unity and whatnot, they are actually fixing their stuff. So if, for example, a window size changes and whatnot, and there's the input region which is changing a little bit, uh, they will actually fix that for you. So please, use the latest one, because otherwise your application will fail when you are trying to be resized. So next thing is uh, also use Intel uh, either 64-bit or 32-bit native code as well. Don't use only ARM, because ARM is, of course, a little bit slower, especially on the high-end devices. So when you're running a game, uh, application quality control might actually be bad for you, depending on what you're doing. So if you have, for example, multiple surfaces and whatnot, and you're trying then to, to squeeze out the latest thing, and if you're running into a state where you're using suddenly quadruple buffering because you're being composited on the desktop or something, your quality control might actually do something negative to your quality, and you get some kind of really weird behavior. So therefore, try it out on Chromebooks before you, before you release it. That would be really awesome. And um, yeah, if you're using a lot of layers, like a lot of surface views and whatnot, you might also fall out of this, and uh, then your quality might actually drop. So therefore, if you can actually do everything in, one, in a single layer instead, please try to do that instead. And always be aware that your window size might change at any point in time. And uh, of course, since a user is, for example, minimizing you, you might actually lose your state. And or if the window gets being resized, uh, the state might actually be lost. So please save your state. Best practices. As I said earlier, we are trying to work with Play Store to actually uh, surface applications which are really good for the Chrome OS environment. So therefore, if you are doing everything which we are asked for, you will actually get a better rating. So therefore, target SDK bigger than 26, uh, that is definitely something good. Implement keyboard mouse uh, uh, and mouse navigation, that is a good thing. Uh, UI elements, when you're resizing, they should always be inside the screen. So because if you're alt tabbing through something and suddenly your element is outside of the screen, that's bad. When you're doing resizing, definitely try to think about landscape and portrait. Both orientations are very really important. Uh, make good use of a lot of space, because you have a lot of space. So use it. I showed you how to. Uh, use architectural components whenever possible in order to save your state or save instant state. That does also do the same thing. Be fluid, and please don't crash. That is really the worst thing which can happen. Check out that you are not crashing. And with that, I'm passing it on to Emily, who is talking about all the great tools we have for you. Thank you. There's so many exciting new things for Android applications on Chrome OS. Um, and I'm honored to be able to present to you three new amazing developer tools to help optimizing your application for Chrome OS faster and easier. Um, the first one, um, you've all been very patient. Um, so thank you for your patience. And a big thank you to the engineering team for making this happen and doing it right. Um, in Android Studio, we're pleased to present uh, the Chrome OS emulator. So right in Android Studio, you have a full Chrome OS image. You can test out the user flow for Chrome OS and, of course, test and optimize your app for Android. Um, your Android application right in Chrome OS, which is awesome. Um, however, if any of you have ever made an Android application, that's my joke. OK, some of you did. Some of you made one. If you do, you'll know there's nothing like testing on a real device, um, especially a form factor like this, um, where the user will be flipping it, rotating it, tossing it on the bed, keyboard input, mouse input, MIDI controllers, stylus input. You just you need to test this on a real device. So we've made that a lot easier. Um, I'm very happy to present um, ADB debugging over USB. It's available for your Pixelbook and your HP Chromebook X2. Um, the public documentation will be out in a week or two, so please watch those links. Um, and more devices coming soon, and it makes development that much easier. OK, so I said there was three exciting developer tools we're announcing 
And um, the first two are awesome. But I actually think the third one is even more exciting. And I truly, truly believe it's going to knock your socks off. And we didn't want anyone to go home with cold feet. So we brought some replacement socks for when they fly off your, uh, your feet. Here's some. And if you're in the middle of the audience or at the back, don't be jealous. There's plenty of socks for everyone. And on your way out of the session, you can, you can pick them up. We're going to have people handing them out. Um, so with that, yes, yeah, socks, right? Socks is your new developer tool. So I'm going to switch over to the Chromebook for a quick demo. We have a terminal. Yes, a terminal. Yeah, a terminal. Yeah. Super exciting terminal. You can see uh, Git clone, all sorts of exciting things. I clone the Code Lab, optimizing your Android application for Chrome OS, which you should check out at the Code Lab tent. There's dinosaurs. Um, but what's interesting about this particular terminal is it's running inside a full Linux environment. Um, no clap? OK. You watch the keynote. You watch the keynote. OK, fine. So if you have a full Linux environment, you can clap for this next one. You can install an application, Linux application, like Android Studio. So here we have Android Studio. Yeah, more exciting than a terminal, I guess. So here I have the code lab loaded up. I'm making those dinosaurs click. I'm adding drag and drop. And I go and hit run. Oh, so if you're in the back and you can't see, that says Google Pixelbook, which means when I press OK, you know, it goes through the Gradle build, um, oh, pushing the application to the device. What? On device. Yeah. So look, you can click. Oh, we got keyboard commands. And that's, it's pushed it straight to the device. So we can program on the Pixelbook in Android Studio, push directly to the device, test your app out. And of course, you have your logcat there with, and all your debugging tools. So this is amazing. Yeah. And I'm so glad the engineering team let me present this super exciting announcement. Um, so we're super excited about Linux on Chromebooks. We're going to tell you how to set it up for yourself. Um, before I do, we had a lot of questions at office hours um, and in the code lab, what's going on behind the scenes? How does this work? How is it set up? So I'm going to give you a brief overview. Um, here's Chrome OS. In real life, it's a bit snazzier, but it's a <laughs> representative box. Um, and inside there, we have the Android container. This is nothing new. Um, this is how your Android apps run on Chrome OS today. Um, of course, what is new is we have a Linux VM. And we install great applications like Tux Racer, which they wouldn't let me show today. Also, Android Studio. Um, and to achieve that last step, which I think is the most exciting, pushing straight to the app and debugging on device, we need to connect ADB to the Android container. Um, to do that, it's quite simple. It's an ADB connect command. It's not a secret IP address. It's the IP address um, for the AD, ADBD um, on the Android container. Um, this will be in the public. It is in the public um, instructions already. But here's a pro tip, since you came to our session. Um, for some situations, it's handy to set up a little SSH tunnel, simple SSH tunnel in Chrome OS, that will just forward those connections automatically. Not necessary. It's helpful in some situations. Um, here's the instructions. If you haven't, oops. Here are the instructions. If you haven't seen it. Um, I think we were number one on Hacker News yesterday or something. So that's kind of exciting. Um, please install it on your Google Pixelbook. Coming to more devices soon. We're super excited about it. Let us know how it works. Try it out. Um, so where are we at? We have an emulator. We have ADB debugging over USB. We've got Linux on Chromebooks running Android Studio, which you can de debug and develop on the device. And you have socks for those long, cold coding nights so your tootsies stay toasty. What's missing? Nothing, right? Except I heard a rumor on the way in that some of you don't yet have a pixel book. What? So um, we're going to help you out a little bit with that. Um, on your way out, when you grab your socks, you can pick up. A coupon for 75% off a Google pixel book. Don't forget your socks. Um, Oh, they're kicking me off the stage. So I'm going to say quickly, come to our code labs. We have two great code labs. You can do the resizing with animations. It looks great. You can make keyboard input, drag and drop, click on the dinosaurs, talk to us office hours today, fill out the survey. Thank you. Can everyone come back on stage? It's a bow. We're done. Yes? 
Shahid, Federico, come on up. Stefan, Paolo, thank you, thank you so much.